This message is on the winning attitude of positive self-control. Positive self-control is the attitude that you take the responsibility for causing your own effects in life. It's a very important theme because losers let it happen and winners make it happen. And when you're able to understand this attitude, you'll have the key to decision-making or making up your mind on your goals easily and effectively. Because winners first want to win, then they discover that they're in control of making it happen. And all the images and all the goals that they've set become more easily obtained because they realize that they're driving. My own motto in life is that life is a do-it-with-God, do-it-for-others, do-it-to-myself program. The true meaning of self-control is often misunderstood. Many people interpret self-control as getting a good grip on yourself or remaining cool under pressure. But self-control as it relates to the psychology of winning is synonymous with responsibility. Winners take full responsibility for their own lives. They believe in cause and effect, and they have that wonderful philosophy that life is a do-it-to-yourself program. Self-control implies freedom for individuals to choose among many alternatives and to shape their own destinies. I know many people who believe that fate or luck or possibly their astrological signs have shaped the outcome of their lives. And these underachievers are people who feel that life is mostly determined by circumstance or predestination or being at the right place at the right time. And they're more likely to give in to doubt and fear and to be wishy-washy and indecisive in the face of a decision that could have led them to true success in their lives. People who are aware that they exert control over what happens to them in life are happier, and they're able to choose more appropriate responses to what occurs. You know, in the Old Testament, in the book of Leviticus, there's a story of the sacred custom called the escaped goat. When the troubles of the people became overwhelming, a healthy male goat was brought into the temple. In a solemn ceremony, the highest priest of the tribe placed his hands on the head of the goat and recited a long list of problems and woes. Having all the problems of the people thus transmitted onto the goat, the goat was then set free to run away, taking all the troubles with him. That was about 4,000 years ago, but the term scapegoat that came from that ancient ceremony still is in full force today. Blaming external forces is as old as the earth, but stays consistently young. After Adam ate of the apple, he quickly pointed at Eve and said, The woman whom you put here with me made me do it. Some people blame their parents, the government, the high deficit, the immigrants for doing higher quality work for lesser pay. They blame their companies, and specifically they blame their bosses. Instead of working on what is going on inside of them, they try to blame that which is around them. It's always easier and more convenient to assume the answer lies elsewhere or with others. If I've learned anything in life, it's God's unfailing boomerang, which is what goes around comes around, and that which you send out you will surely get back in the long run. I've never told a lie that didn't eventually haunt me or hurt me, and I've never done a good deed that didn't help me or heal me in some way. We're not responsible for what happens out there, for what others do or think, but we are responsible only for how we choose to respond. This message is on the winning attitude of positive self-control. Positive self-control is the attitude that you take the responsibility for causing your own effects in life. It's a very important theme because losers let it happen and winners make it happen. And when you're able to understand this attitude, you'll have the key to decision-making or making up your mind on your goals easily and effectively. Because winners first want to win, then they discover that they're in control of making it happen. And all the images and all the goals that they've set become more easily obtained because they realize that they're driving. My own motto in life is that life is a do-it-with-God, do-it-for-others, do-it-to-myself program. The true meaning of self-control is often misunderstood. Many people interpret self-control as getting a good grip on yourself or remaining cool under pressure. But self-control as it relates to the psychology of winning 
is synonymous with responsibility. Winners take full responsibility for their own lives. They believe in cause and effect, and they have that wonderful philosophy that life is a do-it-to-yourself program. Self-control implies freedom for individuals to choose among many alternatives and to shape their own destinies. I know many people who believe that fate or luck or possibly their astrological signs have shaped the outcome of their lives. And these underachievers are people who feel that life is mostly determined by circumstance or predestination or being at the right place at the right time. And they're more likely to give in to doubt and fear and to be wishy-washy and indecisive in the face of a decision that could have led them to true success in their lives. People who are aware that they exert control over what happens to them in life are happier, and they're able to choose more appropriate responses to what occurs. You know, in the Old Testament, in the book of Leviticus, there's a story of the sacred custom called the escaped goat. When the troubles of the people became overwhelming, a healthy male goat was brought into the temple. In a solemn ceremony, the highest priest of the tribe placed his hands on the head of the goat and recited a long list of problems and woes. Having all the problems of the people thus transmitted onto the goat, the goat was then set free to run away, taking all the troubles with him. That was about 4,000 years ago, but the term scapegoat that came from that ancient ceremony still is in full force today. Blaming external forces is as old as the earth, but stays consistently young. After Adam ate of the apple, he quickly pointed at Eve and said, The woman whom you put here with me made me do it. Some people blame their parents, the government, the high deficit, the immigrants for doing higher quality work for lesser pay. They blame their companies, and specifically they blame their bosses. Instead of working on what is going on inside of them, they try to blame that which is around them. It's always easier and more convenient to assume the answer lies elsewhere or with others. If I've learned anything in life, it's God's unfailing boomerang, which is what goes around comes around, and that which you send out you will surely get back in the long run. I've never told a lie that didn't eventually haunt me or hurt me, and I've never done a good deed that didn't help me or heal me in some way. We're not responsible for what happens out there, for what others do or think, but we are responsible only for how we choose to respond. That's our attitude. The responsibility for us is ours. If it is to be, it's up to me. And those people who cannot make up their minds for fear of making the wrong choice, vacillating in indecision, they simply don't meet their goals, which is a requisite for success. Rather, they take their place among the rank and file of the also-rans, and they trudge along in bland mediocrity. When you know where you're going, and you know that you're driving... You can make decisions quickly and easily. And because of this one fact, the winners in life seem to have their minds made up automatically. They're propelled forward without hesitation because they and everyone else involved with them know where they're going and know that nothing is permitted to block their path. All individuals are what they are and where they are because of a composite of all of their own doings at one time or another in their lives. And although their innate characteristics an environment are given to them initially, the decisions that they make determine whether they actually win or lose their particular game of life. Voltaire likened life to a game of cards. Each player must accept the cards that life deals him or her. But once in hand, he or she alone must decide how to play the cards in order to win the game. The writer John Erskine put it a little differently when he wrote, Though we sometimes speak of a primrose path, we all know that a bad life is just as difficult, just as full of work, obstacles, and hardships as a good one. The only choice is the kind of life one would care to spend one's efforts on. Whether you're a bum on skid row or a high achiever or a happy individual, you can pat yourself on the back, taking the credit or the blame for your place. We took over from our parents at a much younger age than we thought, and we've been in the driver's seat ever since. You know, I didn't realize until I was about 30 that I'm behind the wheel in my life. I thought it was my genes, my horoscope, and my childhood. I should have taken a hint from my daughter when she was only 11 months old. I was a headstrong Navy fighter pilot, 
used to wear my silver blue flight suit to mow the lawn so the neighbors would know that a Rambo type was living next door. I used to go out in the freeway in my Porsche Targa looking for Honda Civics to intimidate. I wore my flight helmet with a bolt of lightning painted on it in the car on the freeway, and I'd love to ride the bumper of the car in front of me, pretending I was a Blue Angel flying formation in an air show. I'll never forget that evening when I swaggered into my kitchen in full flight gear to greet my wife and kids, who I thought would be impressed seeing their warrior in his war games uniform. I always wore a gun in my holster with my flight suit, in case I was shot down in a real war and taken prisoner. I figured I'd shoot my way out to freedom. Well, I'm sure you get the picture of a former chauvinist who believed that he was the boss of the house. But then I've always learned the hard way. My 11-month-old younger daughter, Dana, was in her high chair, supposedly eating Gerber's strained squash as the main course. Instead, the squash was in my wife's hair, all over my daughter's bib, and all over the floor. What's going on in here, I growled, putting my flight helmet on the table. It looks like the Vietnam War in here. My wife smiled and said, She doesn't like Gerber's strained squash, so I'm giving her applesauce for nourishment. I couldn't believe she said that. Give me that squash, I said. She eats what we give her. I was raised during the post-depression years, and we were taught to clean our plate. She eats what we give her. Besides, she doesn't have taste buds yet. I took the squash, telling my wife that I'd take charge and get this simple exercise over with. I told my daughter to open up. Her gums clamped shut. I ate several bites as a role model and made slurping approving noises. I nearly gagged. It wasn't that great tasting, but I didn't let on. I told my daughter, It's delicious. Daddy loves it. Her defiant look said it all. It was that go-ahead fat so you finish it look. Well, I'd had about enough. I asked my wife to leave the room. And being in total control of the situation, I pressed her cheeks firmly together with my two fingers, and I forced her mouth open. I laughed at my own take-command success. I then neatly inserted several spoonsful of squash into her mouth, and I held it shut, like every good father would do. Go ahead and swallow it, I ordered. I'm holding on until you do. She made a decision at 11 months old. She decided to die by holding her breath rather than swallow. I totally lost control and exploded. Go ahead and die. You're not the only child. Before you die, you'll swallow. And I glared back at her pinching her mouth shut even more firmly. She made a second decision. She decided to make a squash transfer. As I squeezed tightly, I could feel the pressure build up in her cheeks like Mount St. Helen. I had created the nozzle effect, and like linear acceleration, a steady stream of propelled squash came out the compressed opening in her mouth and up my nose, deep into my nasal pituitary area, and I stopped breathing. I bellowed like a bull and fell convulsing on the floor in my flight suit. My wife, hearing the commotion, tiptoed back in and smiled sweetly. What happened, Top Gun, she said. I said, nothing. She doesn't like strained squash. Don't make a big deal about it. You see, my daughter had decided very early in life that she didn't like squash and wouldn't eat it. She's grown up now and flown the nest. But to this day, she doesn't like the taste of any kind of squash. But then, that's her choice, isn't it? You know, many children learn how to control their parents' lives as well, long before they learn how to talk in complete sentences. If whining gets attention and goodies, the whining continues. Children always do that for which they're rewarded. I saw a five-year-old boy terrorist on a recent flight. He wouldn't sit down in his seat with his seatbelt fastened until his mother and his father gave him their two pieces of chocolate cake for dessert, too. But you and I are not victims of the winds of fate. We are steering our ships. We are not puppets dangling from the strings of our heredity and environment. I know many individuals who have to work late all the time, as if the company or their bosses made them. You and I decide to work late sometimes because there are important things we want to get done. People who have to do things usually resent doing them, but they're not happy doing them, and they're not effective performers or producers. If you feel you have to do anything in life, In that sense, you're irresponsible in that act. Responsible self-control is the path to mental health and frequently to physical health as well. Current research into biobehavior and biofeedback programs has verified the human potential for the control of body functions and brainwave emissions. Through specialized training and discipline, it's possible and maybe even practical for us to control our pulse rate, 
our threshold of pain, our brainwave frequencies, and other body functions as a means of positive health maintenance for the future. Today, clinics throughout the world are teaching people how to raise their body temperature to help prevent the onset of a migraine headache, how to dilate their arteries to permit a greater blood flow to the heart, and how to relax muscles and nerve endings. I worked with Olympic athletes to help them prepare for peak performance using a combination of biofeedback and guided imagery. The next generation of astronauts who will build our permanent space stations and new orbiting cities, they're training their minds to prevent the onset of motion sickness that is common on space flights due to zero gravity conditions that are present during travel in outer space. You know, you and I exert much more voluntary control over what we thought were involuntary body functions and events in life than we ever imagined. This is known as responsibility psychology, and it fits right in with our own spiritual beliefs and sowing and reaping. It holds that irresponsibility and valuelessness lead to abnormal behavior, neuroses, and mental deterioration. The treatment for individuals suffering from these symptoms include showing them that they need not be hung up on the past, but are responsible for their present actions as well as their future behavior. When neurotic individuals are helped to assume personal responsibility, the prognosis for recovery is good. So the winning human beings realize that everything in life is volitional. Even being alive is a choice. Everything in life you and I decide to do because it is profitable to those we care about and good for ourselves. Some choose evil, some choose good. Some choose pleasure without purpose. Others choose purpose which brings pleasure and well-being. You don't have to work. You can choose revolving unemployment or handout. You don't have to pay taxes. You can live in a tax haven or go to prison for tax evasion. You don't even have to fix dinner or have children or even get up in the morning. Many people do none of the above. You decide to do the things you do, not out of compulsion, but because they're beneficial to you and they're the best choices among the alternatives available to help you toward your goals. So the high achievers in life and the real winners are wide open to choices, and they constantly look for a better way to live. In his excellent book, Self-Renewal, John Gardner states that winning individuals do not leave the development of their potential to chance. They pursue it systematically, and they look forward to an endless dialogue between their potentialities and the claims of life. Not only the claims they encounter, but the claims they invent. And daily, thousands are finding that there's a bright new world out there to be discovered. And they're demonstrating the truth of Gardner's statement that we don't even know we've been in prison until we've broken out. We're not only victims of habit in a very real sense. Each of us becomes a prisoner of hundreds of restrictions of our own making. Teenagers have a strong need to conform to the standards of their group. While they may feel that their special way of grooming is an act of independence, on the contrary... Their styles and activities adhere very strictly to the peer group code. Those who refuse to be responsible for their own deeds, looking to others for their behavior cues, they've not reached responsible maturity. And unfortunately, many adults spend their entire lives at this level of immaturity. As we grow into adulthood, we make decisions that progressively narrow our opportunities and alternatives. We select only a few friends, out of the thousands with whom we rub elbows every day. And these friends are usually people with whom we agree, and thus we limit the input of fresh ideas. We choose our educational level, which in turn determines to a great extent our jobs and our associates. And from day to day, we seek the path of least resistance, comfortable in our safe, established ways. The responsible winners look to the shackles that they've placed on themselves by apathy and by lack of imagination, and in a moment of truth, they decry their predicament and make a declaration of independence. They assert their option to choose and assume their rightful role of personal responsibility. Famed anthropologist, sociologist, the late Margaret Mead, called personal responsibility our most important evolution and the notion that we are the product of our environment our biggest sin. You know, there should be a statue of responsibility standing in San Francisco Bay to match the Statue of Liberty, because there can be no liberty or freedom without responsibility. We will be free only as long as we can use freedom responsibly. 
The law of cause and effect is forever the ruler in our lives. Here are some techniques for developing a winning attitude of positive self-control because it's so important to realize that you're driving. First, eliminate the words I have to and I can't from your vocabulary. Get rid of them. There's nothing you have to do. Second, list alternative choices to your current habits, especially those habits you don't care for. Put some new choices down on paper. Third, take the credit and the blame for your decisions openly, but especially take the credit because you got yourself there. Fourth, affirm the self-talk that my rewards in life will always match my service. And fifth, learn how to relax and take more control of your body. Practice some deep relaxation methods and study and learn more about biofeedback techniques. Take greater voluntary control of your involuntary body functions. Learn how to relax your muscles to get rid of tension. Learn how to elevate your skin temperature to get rid of headaches. Learn how to relax and elevate your temperature to increase your blood flow and reduce your heart rate. And set a specific time each week to initiate some action letters and action phone calls in your own behalf. Because you see, the winners in life don't wait for invitations to succeed. They make them happen. In other words, losers do let it happen. And winners do make it happen. So put on paper and create your own horoscope for life. Positive self-control is the attitude that you take responsibility for causing your own effects in your life. A winning attitude of positive self-control leads to the action quality of positive self-discipline. Positive self-discipline is paying the price of winning, and the theme of positive self-discipline is practice, practice, practice. Winners practice positive self-discipline. Self-discipline puts your money where your mouth is. Self-discipline dares you to place a bet on yourself, and self-discipline begins where lip service ends. All of the other winning qualities in this program are absolutely worthless without positive self-discipline. Because you may be motivated by desire, you may feel you're in control, you may expect to go to the moon, you may even imagine yourself on the moon, but you'll never even visit a NASA exhibit without persistent self-discipline. It all seems so simple. You tell your little robot subconscious achievement mechanism, that you want a new self-image and zap, just like a thermostat, up we go. Well, there's a little more effort involved because you've been like you are for some time now. In fact, most of your life. And every day, your actions and reactions usually confirm and support your current self-image. You see, you constantly talk to yourself every minute you're awake at about six to 800 words a minute, maintaining and justifying who you are today. This has been going on for years. Your little robot has matured into a whole control room full of some very big habits. And habits are the key, because habits start out as offhanded remarks, sometimes magazine ads or friendly hints, experiments. And like flimsy cobwebs with very little substance, they begin to grow, layer upon layer, thought upon thought, fused with imagination and emotion, until they become like unbreakable steel cables, to shackle or strengthen our lives. Habits are the attitudes which grow from cobwebs into cables that control your everyday life. The theme of positive self-discipline is make winning your habit. Positive self-discipline alone can make or break a habit. Self-discipline alone can affect a permanent change in your self-image and in you. Many people have defined self-discipline as doing without. But a better definition of self-discipline is doing within when you're doing without. Because self-discipline is no more than mental practice, the commitment to memory of those thoughts and emotions that will override current information stored in the subconscious memory bank. 
And through relentless repetition, these new inputs penetrate into our robot subconscious, resulting in the creation of a new self-image. The art of visualization or mental simulation is not a new concept at all. It's been around since the beginning of time because individuals have fantasized and acted out their whole life scripts in advance, just like a movie right from the beginning. During the past decade, the art of visualization has become more sophisticated. From a simple concept of positive thinking to a highly technical approach complete with computerized digital and video simulation games and programs, current research confirms the incredible ability of the mind to achieve the currently dominant thought by instructing the body to carry out the vivid images of performance as if they'd been achieved before and are merely being repeated. One of the major reasons for many individuals failing to reach their goals is that they do not understand, and if they do, they're not willing to exercise the determination and self-discipline of practicing within when they're doing without. The keys to developing new attitudes, habits, and skills are, one, the commitment to memory, usually in a relaxed or meditating environment, those specific visualizations and accompanying emotions that can override current information stored in your subconscious robot, and two, to relentless repetition, again, again, and again, the penetration and storage of these new inputs into your robot self-image, resulting in the creation of a brand new self-image about that particular act. True self-discipline is telling yourself over and over with words, pictures, concepts, and emotions that you are winning each important victory now. So the winners practice in and out of the office and on and off the playing field. They learn new information, correct information, and then they visualize it, and they simulate each experience they want to achieve. Every winner I've ever met in every walk of life, male or female, young or old, uses the technique of visualization or mental simulation every day in his or her imagination. As former chairman of our Olympic sports psychology program, I met a world champion Russian figure skater, and she told me, You know, Dennis, I rarely fall because I practice each sequence in my imagination at night with my eyes closed, and I could successfully perform my entire routine blindfolded without hesitation. From former Olympic skiing stars like Billy Johnson, Debbie Armstrong, and the Mayer Twins, to all of the marvelous European champions, they've all learned that mental simulation is an excellent way to practice skiing and gain confidence. In your mind, close your eyes, feet together, weight properly balanced, correct knee position, down the fall line, navigate the moguls, feel the crisp exhilaration, the wind, the speed, the open freedom of doing it all yourself. For champions, it's the winning edge. For beginners, it's a great way to conquer fear. After all, in your imagination, you never fall. All of the great golfers like Jack Nicklaus and Greg Norman and Pat Bradley and Kathy Baker, every time they miss a shot, they immediately replay it in their imagination. And tennis greats like Martina Navratilova and Boris Becker, they're simulation masters. You know, some time ago when Jack Nicklaus won the Masters Golf Tournament in his middle 40s, a veteran jockey was simulating while he watched Nicklaus and his son march up the 18th fairway toward the victory celebration in the coveted green jacket. As he watched the TV coverage, writing legend Willie Shoemaker said to himself, If Jack Nicklaus can win the Masters at his age, then I can reach inside myself and win the Kentucky Derby one more time at over 50 years of age. The simulation once again came true as old Willie the Shoe stood in the real winner's circle in Louisville on Derby Day. So the winners in life simulate and practice winning. In other words, they take their successes and build on those. They practice as if they were first, even if their challenge is a first for mankind, because it gets to be a habit with them. The astronauts are the best living examples of winning self-discipline. I had the good fortune to study and observe the Apollo Moon Program astronauts, and I watched the crews playing Let's Pretend We're Going to the Moon. You see, no one had ever done it before. Who other than Jules Verne or Isaac Asimov really dreamed it possible? Astronauts spend years engaged in mental simulation. They practice bobbing up and down in a rubber life raft at sea, responding to the feeling of weightlessness, 
so they'd be experienced in outer space. Then they went to the desert and practiced with a simulated lunar excursion module, as if they were landing it on the surface of the moon. Hour after hour, month after month, year after year, they memorized and simulated the exact theoretical steps with hundreds of critically vital sequences that NASA scientists had imagined and computed would take them safely to the moon and back. And then Neil Armstrong, after 300 practice sessions, took the first step and transmitted his reactions back to mission control in Houston. Houston, the eagle has landed. That's one small step for a man and one giant leap for mankind. But he also radioed back. It was beautiful, just like our drills. You know, I remember sitting next to a woman on a recent flight to Chicago who was making a weird high-pitched humming sound with her eyes closed. I turned the overhead air nozzle on her face and I asked her if she wanted me to call a stewardess to come to her aid. She retorted indignantly, I beg your pardon, I'm an oboist for a symphony orchestra and I'm practicing for tonight's performance. I thought that was weird, but she thought I was weird for interrupting her. And she said, now if you'll excuse me, I'll continue the performance. Perhaps the most riveting example of winning self-discipline that I've ever seen has been exposed to you and me through the experience of our POWs returning from Vietnam. Through the joy and heart-rending cheerful reunions with families those many years ago, did you come to understand the self-discipline in action? Did you hear or did you read about the prisoners' habit patterns in practice sessions during those three to five to seven years of deprivation and boredom? What would you do if you were locked up with no end in sight? Would you sleep? Would you read? Would you do push-ups? Would you get depressed a lot? Would you feel sorry for yourself? Would you resent the folks back home? Or would you, as most of them did, make prison camp a self-improvement retreat? Several of our POWs made guitars out of wooden sticks and strings, and although their crude instruments made no sound at all, those who knew how to play practiced from memory, listening in their imaginations. They taught each other many new chords and finger positions and songs, and some POWs who had never held a guitar before are now accomplished flamenco guitarists. Seven years is a long time to practice. And other POWs at the Hanoi Hilton, they fashioned piano keyboards by taking a flat board and pencil sketching the keys actual size. Although their Steinways were silent and unplayable, they practiced day after day and enjoyed their favorite selections and others practiced typing on imaginary typewriters and came back at 40 words a minute without an error the first time they had ever typed on a real IBM typewriter. Physical fitness abounded in the prison camps. When there was nothing else to do, they did sit-ups. And one POW now holds the world's record, 4,500 sit-ups without resting. I'll never forget the story of Air Force Colonel George Hall, who played an imaginary round of golf every day during his five and a half years as a POW in North Vietnam. In his 8x8 cell, in black pajamas and bare feet, Colonel Hall played his best rounds of golf. You see, he'd been a four handicapper back home at the club, which many shot in the middle 70s. But in his mind, he played every shot, every club. He teed up every ball. He replaced every divot. He pulled out the flag on the green. He studied the break and putted down. Every game he'd ever played well in the past and every course he'd not yet played, but only seen on television before. In other words, he played golf in his mind by replaying his best games, which is called the reinforcement of success, and pre-playing every game he had not yet played, which is called the pre-enforcement of future success. Those mental exercises really paid off for him when he got back to the real game of golf. After seven golfless years and five and a half years in solitary confinement, Weak from malnutrition and seriously atrophied and underweight, Colonel George Hall was back in form only a few weeks after his release from North Vietnam after the peace settlement. He played in the Greater New Orleans PGA Golf Open in the Pro-Am Tournament and unbelievably shot a 76 right onto his handicap of four over par. The news media interviewed Colonel Hall after his round of golf. Congratulations, sir, they said. How do you account for your incredible round of golf? A case of beginner's re-entry luck? Colonel Hall smiled and replied softly, Luck? Are you kidding? 
I never three-putted a green in all my five and a half years of practice. Colonel Hall had witnessed what every astronaut, every pilot, every Olympic athlete, every salesperson, every hostess planning a party, every musician, and what every winner has learned. If you do it right in practice, you'll do it right in life. In your imagination, you can learn to never miss. Many of our POWs taught each other a foreign language. At least 50 of our returnees learned to speak at least three languages fluently. There were no Bibles at the Hanoi Hilton, so the POWs pooled their memory banks, and they reconstructed hundreds of the most significant passages for their Sunday worship services. And the POWs and hostages also taught each other skills from rote memory. They discussed and rediscussed childhood experiences of mutual interest and value. They created complete mental diaries while in solitary confinement. And they invented hundreds of money-making ideas. And perhaps most importantly, they gained perspective by remembering and sharing ideals about this country that have been the foundation of its greatness. They learned that simulation is the greatest tool in the universe and that it is the universe of the POW and the hostage. So you need to discipline yourself to win. You need to practice within when you're without. And you practice right before you go to sleep at night. And you practice right after you wake up in the morning. And you practice in the shower. And you practice in the car. And you practice whenever you have the free time. Because winning self-discipline is doing within when you're doing without.